The day that etched Charles Manson into the mind of the world's collective consciousness was Friday, August 8, 1969. That was the fateful weekend when Manson's alleged cult, the Manson family, slaughtered seven people. It wasn't the first time the group had committed murder, nor would it be the last, but the events of that weekend are why Charles Manson will be remembered as the devil incarnate, a real-life boogeyman capable of untold evil, a maniacal puppet master who carved a swastika into his head with a razor blade. The crimes of that weekend captured the attention of the nation and plunged Los Angeles into a state of panic. Gun sales skyrocketed and parents began walking their kids to school, worried that Manson's satanic family could strike at any moment. Charles Manson was not physically with the four who came across their initial victim on the night of August 8, but his influence on their actions would be debated for decades to come. In a tragic twist of fate, the first victim of this infamous crime spree was simply in the wrong place at the wrong time. Stephen Parent was an 18-year-old California native whose freshman yearbook photo looks remarkably like Buddy Holly. The oldest of five, Stephen was raised in El Monte, a city east of Los Angeles. His family was working class and, being the eldest, Stephen was ambitious. His father had nurtured Steve's love of electronics and by the summer of 1969, Stephen was working two jobs with plans to attend community college in the fall. On the evening of August 8th, just after 11 p.m., Stephen had closed up shop at his second job at Jonas Miller Stereo and driven through Los Angeles to visit an acquaintance who lived in a guest house at the far end of a secluded property in Beverly Hills. The property was located at 10050 Cielo Drive. The guest house was part of a sprawling lot that sat on a hilltop overlooking a section of Beverly Hills called Benedict Canyon. Cielo Drive itself is a short, winding road that looks like it doesn't belong in the middle of Los Angeles. On the far side of Cielo Drive was a daunting metal gate that guarded the entrance to a driveway leading up to the house. Though driveway is an accurate description, it's not an apt one. The driveway was more like a secondary road that led up a steep incline, so steep that the property was not visible from the gate. Stephen had driven up the winding driveway in the hopes of selling an AM-FM Sony Digimatic radio to Bill Gerritsen, the property's caretaker. Two weeks earlier, Stephen had picked up Bill, who was hitchhiking on Sunset Boulevard, and driven him back home to Cielo Drive. On August 8th, Steve stopped by to show Bill a radio he was trying to unload for some quick cash. Bill was listening to the Mamas and the Papas and finishing a TV dinner when Stephen arrived just before midnight. Bill admired the radio but decided not to buy it, so Steve called another friend on Santa Monica Boulevard, leaving the guest house just after midnight. With the radio in hand, Steve traversed the property, passing a large swimming pool near the main house and climbing back into a white 1965 Rambler Ambassador, which his father had purchased for him. Steve placed the radio on the passenger seat and began driving down the long, winding driveway. As Stephen pulled away, Bill finished his late-night meal, turned up his stereo, and sat down to write some letters. At the same time, Stephen approached the gate at the base of the hill where his headlights lit up the four members of the Manson family. Three women and one man were hiding in the night, dressed in black, armed with buck knives, and carrying a large rope and a single handgun. The gun, a 22 caliber revolver with a brown wooden grip and long barrel, looked like a comedic prop in a spaghetti western, but the Manson family knew the gun was capable. When Stephen came upon them, he rolled down his window and was immediately attacked using a buck knife. His assailant slashed at him through the driver's side window with quick, frenetic motions. Stephen raised his left arm, trying to deflect the buck knife swinging at him wildly. The knife slashed through the flesh of his palm, scraping bone before catching his wristwatch and severing the band. Stephen's reaction sent the watch flying into the back seat as he screamed for help. With blood gushing down Stephen's arm, a second assailant shot him four times with the long-barreled revolver. The bullets burst through Stephen's chest and left arm. The attacker then shot him in the face at point-blank range. The force of the gunshot slumped Stephen's head awkwardly to his right, positioning his body 
with a lifeless gaze into the footwell of the passenger seat, looking past the clock radio. Blood poured down the armrest and saturated Stephen's plaid shirt. With their first victim disposed of, a member of the murder party reached across Stephen's corpse and turned off the engine and headlights, leaving the keys in the ignition. They paused, waiting to see if the gunshots had been heard, but to their surprise, the night remained silent. They continued on, going up the steep driveway toward the main house. The group of four were disheveled, all dressed in a collection of dark clothing picked from a pile at their communal home. The blood from their first victim disappeared into the fabric, further concealed by the night. They were dirty, the women were barefoot, and all were in various stages of an amphetamine high, acid trip, or some combination of the two. When they reached the main house, they looked for a way in. A home invasion is a particularly terrifying crime. The intruders know someone is home and go inside anyway. The occupants are part of the intent. The de facto leader of the party was named Charles Watson, a six foot two, 23 year old who spoke with a distinct Southern drawl, earning him the nickname Tex. The girls waited by the front door while Tex crawled inside through an unlocked window, opening the front door to let them in. As Tex crept through the living room, he moved quietly, aware that the home's occupants could not call for help as he'd cut the phone lines prior to coming up the driveway. Bill remained in the guest house, listening to music and going about his evening, unaware that his friend was lying dead in the driveway and the Manson family was stalking their prey in the main house. At one point, he attempted to make a call and realized the phone line was dead. He shrugged and didn't think much of it, attributing the interruption to a similar problem they'd had with the phone company the month before. Inside the main house, the Manson family convened in a dark living room with a cabin-style decor, eyeing a man sleeping on a sofa. The man was dressed in casual clothes, which contrasted with a blanket made to look like the American flag that was strewn across the back of the sofa. Unbeknownst to the home invaders, the sleeping man was Wojciech Frykowski, a house guest who had passed out while the home's other occupants had retired to their rooms. Wojciech stirred, still asleep with his shoes on and his back to the door, as the intruders gathered around him. The girls giggled and crept closer, which pulled Wojciech out of his slumber. What time is it? he asked, still in a semi-conscious fog, not realizing he was speaking to four people who had broken into the house to kill him. Wojciech was answered with a swift kick to the face. Within minutes, the four members of the murder party had rounded up the other occupants of the home and brought them into the living room. Out of fear and confusion, the people staying in the house complied with their captors. Wojciech Frykowski remained on the couch, sitting beside his girlfriend, a petite 25-year-old brunette named Abigail Folger, also a house guest. Nearby was a third house guest, 35-year-old Jay Sebring, a tall, handsome Hollywood hairdresser. Closest to Jay was the only person who actually lived in the house, a gorgeous 26-year-old movie star named Sharon Tate. With blonde flowing hair and dark eyes, she was stunningly beautiful and noticeably in the late stages of pregnancy. With all assembled in the living room, the Manson family went about using towels and pillowcases to tie up and blindfold their intended prey. The improvisation of the night was self-evident. Armed with dull buck knives and a vintage revolver, they hadn't brought the proper tools to butcher several people. The women tracked dirt through the house, leaving footprints with their bare feet. The large band of rope they'd brought was not used to bind the hands of their victims. Instead, they tied the rope in a frantic noose around the neck of Sharon Tate, then looped it over a large beam that ran across the ceiling, tying the other end around the neck of Jay Sebring. The rope was given enough slack so they could both move several feet or even lie down without it becoming tight. Sharon Tate and Jay Sebring were panic-stricken but cooperative amongst the pleas of their friends for some sort of explanation. Who are you people? What do you want with us? They were answered by Tex. I am the devil and I'm here to do the devil's business, he told them plainly, 
his voice devoid of emotion due to the drugs racing through his brain. Tex ordered Sharon Tate and Jay Sebring to lie down on their stomachs, still bound with the rope slung over the beam above and fastened around their necks. In a state of desperation, Jay Sebring pleaded with Tex, saying that Sharon Tate should be allowed to sit, given that she was almost nine months pregnant. Even while terrified himself, Sebring was valiant in continuing to challenge Tex, who was barking orders and directing the victims with the gun. Sebring grew more agitated, moving closer to Tex, causing the noose to pull tighter around his neck. Tex responded with a mix of threats and transient apathy brought on by the wavering levels of drugs coursing through his body. Tex shook his head, attempting to focus on the task at hand, when the confrontation with Jay Sebring exploded into a fistfight. The two men wrestled violently toward the front door, the noose pulling tighter around Jay's neck, causing him to sputter and cough. Tex gripped the gun tightly in a growing rage. The girls yelled and laughed, threatening the other captives to keep still. Jay used his free hand to tug at the rope, freeing enough slack to catch his breath and allowing both men to spill out of the entryway onto the porch. Tex caught Sebring in the nose with a right hook. Blood poured down Jay's face, giving Tex enough time to aim the gun and pull the trigger. The deafening sound of a 22 caliber long-barreled pistol echoed back into the house. Sebring followed the noise, stumbling back into the living room amidst the screams and panic of Sharon Tate and the others. The captive's hopes of escaping unharmed had evaporated. Their friend was dying in front of them. Their captors were gleeful. Jay collapsed onto his right side with blood pouring down his purple button-up shirt. The bullet had torn through the left side of his body, coming out of his chest. Tex pounced, stabbing wildly, and Sebring had just enough energy to try and fight off the attack with his left hand while covering the gunshot with his right. The fight ended with Tex plunging his knife deep into the center of Sebring's chest, the blow causing Jay to drop his guard. The knife lodged deep, slicing Jay's aorta, the major source of blood to the body. Blood sprayed from the wound, forced out from the final pumps of Jay's heart. Tex continued to thrust the knife into Jay's back, even though he was clearly dead. Sharon Tate screamed and cried, still bound to Jay. Watching Jay's murder, Wojciech Frykowski and Abigail Folger were subdued by fear more than physical restraints. Their hands were poorly tied with towels. With a rush of adrenaline, Wojciech jumped off the couch in a bid to escape. He was immediately tackled by one of the girls, and they wrestled onto the floor in a screaming, chaotic display. Both Wojciech and his attacker screamed for help, prompting Tex to intervene. Using the butt of the revolver, Tex hit Wojciech across the face, breaking Wojciech's skin and smashing the handle to pieces. Wojciech was momentarily stunned. While the girl slashed wildly, the blade catching Wojciech's legs with superficial cuts. Wojciech ignored the pain and the blood that streamed down his legs, somehow managing to partially free himself from the altercation. Moving closer to the exit, Wojciech towed the girl and Tex up the hallway. Blood poured from Wojciech's forehead, smearing the walls. At the same time, another of the Manson family girls attempted to stab Abigail Folger from behind. The knife caught Abigail in the neck and the shock prompted her to free herself and run for her life. Abigail fled down the hallway with blood pouring from her neck. She reached the master bedroom, which contained a shuttered exit that opened to the pool. Abigail slammed into the shutters and frantically opened the door with her attacker seconds behind. Abigail fell through the door, quickly losing blood that smeared the shutter and pooled onto the floor. The girl tried to stab her but fell on top of her, and they both rolled out onto the grass. Abigail freed herself again and ran toward the guest house. The girl lunged at Abigail, slashing wildly with a knife, once again catching Abigail in the neck and stabbing her in the lower back. The latter broke Abigail's stride, and she slammed into the lawn face first and flipped onto her back, only to be straddled by the knife-wielding young woman. The girl slashed at Abigail, who raised her hands to shield herself from the blade frantically coming toward her. 
The knife shredded her hands, spraying blood. Abigail turned her head to her right and closed her eyes. The knife made progress past her arms, slashing at her face. Out of shock and exhaustion, Abigail became unable to defend herself. Losing blood rapidly, she looked her attacker in the eye, ceasing to struggle. Her last words were, I give up. Take me. Her arms dropped and the girl planted the knife into Abigail's chest, pulling the knife in and out until Abigail's crisp, full-length white nightgown became so saturated with blood it appeared red. Hearing the screams of her friends being slaughtered on her front lawn, Sharon Tate composed herself enough to speak to the lone Manson family girl left guarding her, a 20-year-old skinny brunette with wild eyes. Sobbing and panic-stricken, Sharon begged for her life and for the life of her unborn child. The girl's response was plain and full of bravado as she knelt down to whisper in Sharon Tate's ear. Look, bitch, she said, you're gonna die tonight, but I don't feel a thing behind it. When the chaos subsided from the escaping house guests who now lay dead on the lawn, the Manson family reconvened in the living room. They taunted and stabbed at Sharon Tate, who was still restrained by the neck to the middle of the room. The rope had enough give to allow them to struggle to the porch, at which point Sharon was stabbed in the back repeatedly before being dragged back into the living room. As she struggled, the rope around her neck pulled tight, hanging her as she fought against the knives piercing her skin, covering her in her own blood. Sharon guarded her pregnant belly as the women stabbed at her chest, planting a knife into her heart. Blood gushed from the wound, ending Sharon's struggle. The attackers were not finished. The wild-eyed brunette proposed cutting the baby out of her, but decided against it. Instead, they used their hands to smear Sharon Tate's blood all over her body, grotesquely painting her pregnant belly red. They played with her corpse, staging it, to their liking. In a final display of savagery, the wild-eyed girl dipped a towel in Sharon Tate's blood and crouched by a large white door to write PIG in bold red letters. At the same time, Charles Manson was on a ranch, looking into the sky and strumming his guitar. Nowhere near the murders, unable to communicate with the murderers, having no idea who had just been killed. I've always wondered what Manson was thinking, sitting 40 miles away from the events that would come to define his life and change America forever. Hippie Cult Leader The Last Words of Charles Manson Written by James Buddy Day Narrated by Russell Newton Hippie Cult Leader is brought to you by Optimum Publishing International, a division of J.F. Moore Lithographers, Incorporated. Toronto, Canada. ISBN 978-0-88890-299-3. All rights reserved. Dean Baxendale, President and Publisher.